welcome you tonight to um, our midweek Bible study. I don't know if you have felt it or perceived. God is always doing a new thing. Can we push this back a little bit, Mr. Henry? God is always doing a new thing. And he's waiting for people to be able to recognize what he's doing, to line up with what he's doing. And so, I'm sorry, if you could just tilt this up a little bit. Tilt it back, yes. That's good right there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. We don't, we don't come to church just to come to church. Amen. We don't, help me Holy Spirit tonight. We don't, um, we shouldn't do what we do out of religion or out of duty. But we have to become a people that does what they do out of revelation. What is revelation? Revelation is I know what it means for me to do X, Y, Z. I know how it affects the spiritual realm when I pray. When I pray, in the name of Jesus, I have the power to move mountains. So that means that when you go into the place of prayer, you come in with an assurance, with a pit bull uh, faith, with an aggressive faith that says, because the word of God says that if I ask anything in the name of Jesus, according to the will of God, Jesus, the Father, the Son, will all work together to do it. So you don't go into the place of prayer in tears, even though you may be hurting, you don't go into the place of prayer with doubt. You don't go into the place of prayer saying, well, God, will you really do it? If his word says that he will do it, yes. he'll do it. Yes. How many times does somebody come up to Jesus and say, well, Jesus, if you're willing, if you're willing to heal me, he's like, he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? Am I, am I willing? Dad, did you not read where it says I came to deliver the captive? I came to preach the gospel to the poor. I came to heal the sick and to open blind eyes. That's why I'm here. So why are you asking me if I'm willing? I am willing and I am able, but can you believe? But can you believe? So we have to understand that the things that we do, we have to do it out of revelation. Pastor Corey, he, he admonished us to be here on Friday night at 8 p.m. to come because we have to realize we're in a, we're in a heightened time of warfare. This past week, I think that there were, the same weekend that Corey had the car accident, there were three other people in the congregation that had car accidents. We had someone else that came and injured their hand. We have had people having deaths in the family. I've already heard of three people that have family members that have died in the past two days. Uh, serious situations, sickness, all types of things. Don't you think that the enemy, he tries to come and push back. Yes. But you have to know that greater is he that is in you yes. than he that is in the world. God did not create us to fail. God did not create us to bow our head down to the circumstances. Yes, we're tempted to do so because we have emotions and we have feelings, but that's when we have to pull on the spirit of God that is within us and say, God, I believe. Help my unbelief. Yes. Where you got to speak to your spirit and you got to tell yourself, I am not, even if you, have, if you have to wipe the tears from your face, I am not going to succumb to this demonic spirit that wants me to give in. I'm not going to yield. You may bend me, but you're not going to break me. You have to see yourself, not just you being the only one in the war, but you have to see yourself within Christ. So while you're in the war, it's not just you by yourself warring with the enemy and warring with circumstances. No, you have one that envelops you. You have one that covers you all around your front. You have one that covers you all around the back. You have one that is coming all, I mean, a hedge of protection all the way around you because he's your father. So we have to know why we do, what do we want? What do we want from God in this new year? What do we desire? Is it just about God teach me how to pray so that I can pay my bills? God, teach me how to confess so that I can declare and decree the things that I want to fulfill my own agenda or my own need? Or is it, God, give me a revelation of your word so I can truly be an agent of the kingdom of God? Teach me who you are so that I can understand who I am. 
See, those are the messages that are not necessarily popular because we begin to teach and to preach messages that are not just about us getting what we need and what we want. The word of God says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. So he didn't say, seek first how to pay your bills, seek first your personal prosperity, seek first uh, the things that concern you. No, he said, seek first my kingdom and his righteousness. Who's the righteousness? Jesus. So when you seek that first, he comes right back around. And he takes care of everything that concerns you without you even having to worry about it because that's the kind of God that he is. There's something that my dad shared with me probably at least six months ago and I want to share it tonight because I think that is very important for us to understand how to posture our heart. When you hear Corey talking about winning souls and about going out and being the light and talking to people about Jesus, the, you can win people one-on-one -on -one but there's something about when a body of believers all set their heart to say, we want a move of God. We want what is called revival. Where does revival come from? Revival begins with prayer. Revival begins with seeking God. But do you realize that there are certain things that have been established in the church, in the modern day church, that are the enemies of revival? There are things that are already second nature to us in our church culture that is the enemy of a visitation of God. It's the enemy of allowing you to grow in God. It's the enemy of you receiving revelation of who you really are in God. So we have to become, we gotta get, you gotta get bothered. You have to come to a place where you get bothered, where you're just like, you know what, I, I, Pastor Joanne, Pastor Corey, or whoever else, don't just come and just give me a word that's gonna make me feel good. Tell me what I need to change. Yeah. Tell me what I need to do. Yeah. Tell me how I need to posture. Teach me how to pray. Teach me how to declare the promises of God, not just for my own uh, personal gain, but for the gain of the kingdom. Yes. God, what is your agenda in this season? God, what do you want for my family in this season? God, what do you want for Rain Fire Church? What do you want for the country? Because you know what? Our agenda is not what is necessary, what is needed, and what is called for. What is needed and what is called for is the agenda of God. Because he has this big master plan that we're all a small part of. And it's when everybody is in their position and everybody is connecting to him and everybody is playing their part that we're able to see great change. You've received miracles since you have aligned yourself with God, but how much more would we be able to experience if we truly understood to identify what are the enemies of a move of God and steer away from those things and begin to draw nigh to the things that we know that please the heart of God. Because that's the bottom line. You cannot walk with God to just bring a good feeling to yourself. This walk with God just can't be about us. But it has to be about Him. Somebody say it has to be about Him. Go with me to Hosea 5, verse 15. We're going we're gonna to look at this one scripture and then we're going to briefly discuss 10 things, 10 things that hinder revival. <coughs> what is revival? A move of God. What is revival when the spirit of God comes upon a body of believers or a whole city or a whole state? When people are getting saved by the droves, when people are getting healed miraculously without no one even touching them, where it is a supernatural and a sovereign outpouring of the power of God. And let me tell you, in this generation, in the generation that we're living in right now, look at me, in the generation that you and I are living in right now, bringing people to church is not going to be enough. Bringing them to church is not going to be enough. Because if they don't encounter the power of God when they come, if they don't encounter like a, a, a burning bush experience, they're not going to be convinced because the bondage of the world, the bondage of sin, the bondage of everything. I mean, people, there are no restraints. Think about it. In our society today, there are no restraints. There's no sexual restraints. There's no moral restraints. There's no mental restraints. Everything goes. Everything is okay. So we can just do whatever we want to do. We can do whatever we feel like doing. 
And with every act, and with every attitude, and with every rebellion, the enemy is just putting more shackles on them. <laughs> to the point where they're so bound in the things of the spirit that they cannot even move without him yanking their collar. Like a slave. And they don't even see it. And they think this is being free. But the word of God says that it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. If they don't encounter the true anointing, I'm not talking about emotion. Yeah. I'm not talking about just singing the right song and people get excited and jumping around. I'm talking about that when they come into the presence of God, that the presence of God is so thick yeah. that they cannot deny what they feel. Sometimes they'll cry. Sometimes they'll, you know, but we have to seek and we have to desire that type of outpouring because if we don't desire it, it will never come. I think that's one of the reasons why Corey is saying Friday night, we need to pray. It's something that we used to do every Friday. And then for whatever reason, it became inconvenient. We gotta go back. So Lord, we repent. And under the leadership of Corey, we'll go back to the first works. To the first things that we did. Because those Friday night prayers established something in the spirit of this church and this ministry. It established something in our lives. Look at Hosea, verse uh, 15, chapter 5. It says, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. This is God talking, okay? I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. And in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. We have to understand that we serve a God who at times, because of our attitude and because of our actions, he is offended with us. He withdraws himself from the church. He withdraws himself from congregations. He withdraws himself from believers because he is, has been disrespected. He has been overlooked. And some people don't even know that they're doing it. Some people have said to God and to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit, get out of the way because I'm the head of this church, right? And God is saying, okay, I'll get out of the way. But when God gets out of the way, the Holy Spirit leaves with him. If the Holy Spirit leaves with him, what do we have left? A social club? If the Holy Spirit leaves with him, then who's going to produce the miracles? Who's going to produce the signs? Who's going to produce the wonders? Who will produce the deliverance? Who will bring the change into the heart of man? You cannot convince someone's heart to change. It has to be a move of God, an act of God that brings the change to someone's heart. So the number one thing, the number one thing, the number one thing that is a hindrance to revival, number one, is the lack of repentance in the people of God. What does it mean to repent? See, if everything goes and if everything is okay, then how can we repent if we don't know what's wrong? If we don't acknowledge sin as sin, then how do we repent? How do we repent? If there's no repentance, there can be no move of God because God cannot co-live, He cannot cohabitate with people that are living willfully sin sinning and not knowing that there's something wrong with that. So when you have an attitude with your spouse or you have a rebellious attitude in your heart, you can't just brush it off. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit when he says, hey, that attitude is wrong. You need to come into my presence and you need to repent. What is it to repent? To turn from your ways. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I was wrong. But how can you say that you're wrong and repent if you don't know that what you did was wrong? Because nowadays, nothing is sin. But guess what? The word of God, it even says, it goes as far as this, when you know what to do and you don't do it. God, leave. It's not just the adultery, the fornication, the lying. You know, and this is some meat tonight. This is not fluffy, fluffy word. This is for the grown-ups. How many grown-ups do I have in the room tonight? Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. So you have to know. You have to know what it is. You have to, you have to be bold enough to say, man, when I did get up to pray this morning and God woke me up, I knew he was calling me and I rolled over. That was a sin. Father, forgive me. Forgive me. See, why was it that David was considered a man after God's own heart? Because he was constantly in a place to say, when he was called out on his sin, he didn't make excuses for himself, but he said, you know what created me a clean heart? He said to the prophet, yes, I have sinned, only I. He didn't throw, the, the, he didn't throw um, Bathsheba under the bus. He didn't say, oh, well, it's her fault because she was taking a bath and I just happened to see her and I was tempted because of what she did. He didn't pull an Adam. Right. He did not pull an Adam, which was blaming the woman. Right. No, David said, I have sinned. I have sinned. When there's a people that don't understand the importance of repentance, asking God for forgiveness, and then saying, Holy Spirit, help me to turn from my wicked ways. Help me not to be this person anymore. Holy Spirit, I don't want to continue to be rebellious. Holy Spirit, I don't want to continue to be angry. Holy Spirit, I don't want to continue uh, uh, you know, what, whatever it is that God has shown you in his word. It's repentance. Repentance opens the door for intimacy. If I have an argument with my husband, until somebody repents, there's going to be a wedge. We're going to feel an invisible distance. I don't want to be around you. You don't want to be around me. But the moment that somebody, even if it's just one person, says, and babe, I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. The communion is restored. The connection is restored. Now I'm not angry anymore. Repentance is a key part of your relationship with God. And it's not about having a guilty conscience. It's about acknowledging, man, that was, that was not like God. That thing that I did was not like God. Father, forgive me for giving into my flesh. Father, forgive me for giving into my anger. Father, forgive me for having an attitude when I knew that was not the right attitude to have. Father, forgive me and help me because I want to look like you. So that draws the heart of God. That draws the spirit of God. Because God cannot resist a contrite heart. God cannot resist a heart that repents. That's why he took David right back in because he was like, man, how can I resist you? You've taken responsibility for what you've done. And he's still considered a man after God's own heart. What's the second thing? What's the second thing that hinders a move of God? Hinders revival. The second thing is justification or excuses for sin and labeling it as weakness. So it's one thing to have a heart that does not want to repent. But then it's another thing on top of that for you to always make excuses. So for example, the prophet comes to David and said, you killed a man. You, you laid with his wife. You got her pregnant. This sounded like, like reality TV. He could have said, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want to do. Who do you think you are? I'm the boss here. I'm just human. This is just a weakness. He could have made excuses for himself. He could have said, oh, it doesn't matter because there's grace. The grace of God will cover my sin. Wait a minute. The grace of God can cover your sin when there's repentance. If there's no repentance, then there's no grace. The grace of God gives us the opportunity to get it right. We cannot live in our sin and think, hey, this is okay. No, because that hurts the heart of God and it moves him away from us. So let's become of those people that when God taps on your heart and says, hey, that wasn't right, don't make excuses for yourself. Don't defend yourself in the presence of God. Just be like David, okay God, I did it. I did it and I'm sorry. Change my heart. Make me more like you. Make me more like you. What's the third thing that can really, and now we're talking about on a church level. Now we're not just talking about individually, but this is these are things that are happening on a church level that affect the posture and the mentality and the mindset of the church of Jesus Christ at large, okay? When there is a preaching of grace, of God's grace, that doesn't motivate us as believers to sanctify ourselves. Okay? 
So what does that mean? If somebody is preaching to you and they say, everything is good. It doesn't matter what you do. The grace of God will cover you. The grace of God. If there's grace and the grace covers you, then what motivation do you have to get it right? Okay, well, I can just, I just, I can continue to live in adultery because there's grace. I can continue to lie and live a lying lifestyle because there's grace. I can continue to be contentious or jealous or a backbiter or a gossiper or a person that hurts and harms others because there's grace. There's no motivation. There's no, you, you have to, we, we kind of have to go back to the old, the old landmark where it says the word of God says without holiness. No man can see God. So that means that we have a personal responsibility to use the grace of God as a ladder to climb out of our sin. The grace of God is right there on the cross. The grace of God is right there on the cross. That blood that Jesus shed on the cross is what gives us the opportunity to come before the throne of God and say, please forgive me of my sin. Not just when you get saved, but throughout your life. Throughout your life. When I offend my husband, I can't just say, well, I apologize to you last year. That should be enough to cover every other offense that I would ever do for the rest of our married life. Is that going to work? No. No. But it's an honor and a respect. For you, you should be motivated to want to be holy. You should be motivated to say, I want to be like God. I want to love like God. I want to forgive like God. I want to be like God. There has to be a motivation to use that grace to, to draw nigh, to, to draw closer to him. To say, I don't want to just be who the enemy wants me to be or who my flesh wants me to be. Amen. Because your flesh will pull you in the complete opposite direction of God. And those things hinder revival. When you think about the upper room, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, what does it say? They were all on one accord. They were all praying. They were all seeking the same thing. We have to put in our effort. Things are not just, a move of God doesn't just happen. There's people that get hungry and they say, man, I don't want to keep living like I used to live. I don't want to talk like I used to talk. I don't want to have an attitude like my attitude used to be. I want to be, I want to, I want to show on the outside what Jesus has done on the inside. I want to live like that new creation. I want to pray. I want to fast. I want to draw near to God. I want to experience, God, everything that you have for us. And then we all begin to ask for that together. That opens the heavens. It allows God to pour out his spirit. And that's the doorway that we want to open. I'm going to go through the rest of these fairly quickly. Number four, when you abandon fasting and prayer, because you don't understand that fasting and prayer is the thing that God uses for us to be able to surrender to him completely. There has to be fasting. There has to be prayer. If there's no fasting and prayer, how do we completely surrender to God? When you pray, there's an exchange. When you pray, you're coming to God and you're saying, okay, God, here I am in all of my imperfections and I want to give you my imperfection, but I'm asking that you would fill me with your perfection. I'm giving you my sinful nature and I'm asking you to give me your holy nature. I'm giving you my doubtful mind and my evil mind sometimes and I'm asking you to give me the mind of Christ. Those things happen when we pray. When we fast, if you... If you can learn to turn down your plate, if you can learn to deny your body food or sweets, it becomes easier to learn to deny your body when it wants sex out of order. Because it's all about appetite. It's all about what your body wants. My body wants to eat. My body wants intimacy, but you're not married. Yeah, but that's what my body wants, and I have to give my body what my body wants. So you're going to let your body take you to hell because you don't know how to tell your body, no, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. My body belongs to God, and I'm not just going to give it to anybody until my husband or my wife comes because I want to keep it pure. I don't want to deal with that, the, the guilt. I don't want to deal with the condemnation. I don't want to deal with the sexually transmitted diseases. I don't want to deal with 
on the, you know, on uh, unplanned pregnancy. It's like really being honest with ourselves to say, okay, God, this road of fasting and prayer is going to help me to open my heart to you and it's allow you, it allows you, God, to come into my heart and deal with all the junk yes. that people can't see. That allows the Spirit of God to come into your life. It allows the Spirit of God to come into a church. So if I don't ever say to you, hey, it's important to fast, it's important to pray, and you continue to struggle in life, when I stand before God, he's going to come to me and say, why don't you tell me? Well, I, I don't want them to stop giving. I don't want them to stop bringing their tithes and their offering because we, we, gotta, we have a lifestyle to uphold or we got bills to pay. I don't even know if he would let me into heaven. You see what I'm saying? Because as a pastor, I'm going to be judged more harshly according to the word of God. And he's going to say, how dare you? How dare you compromise my word to just make people feel comfortable? Corey had a session of physical therapy yesterday. And he stood up for the first time. Do you think it was comfortable for him? It wasn't comfortable. I feel, I feel the pressure in my leg. I feel like my knee just wants to explode because his knees were shattered in the accident. But guess what? That feeling of being uncomfortable is necessary for him to rehabilitate his legs. So you know what? Sometimes in church, the feeling of being uncomfortable is gonna be necessary for you to get rid of that sinful nature. It's gonna be necessary for you to be able to have a Holy Spirit mirror put in front of you that says, hey, you got a stank attitude and you gotta deal with it and it has to go. If you want the great things that God has for you, you gotta change your mindset, you gotta change your attitude, you gotta change the way you talk and change the way you walk. You can't be walking around talking about, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian and then the next time somebody cuts you off, you flipping them off. Because we don't have self-control. Because we're led by the flesh. And then somebody that you were uh, ministering to at the grocery store sees you doing it and says, Ooh, what kind of Jesus is that? Because the world, the world, the world expects for us to be holy. But we keep making excuses for being holy. They expect us to tell the truth. They expect us not to sleep around. Because we're Christians. They expect us to be honest. They expect us not to be gossipers and not to backbite. It's only within us that we keep making excuses for ourselves and we say, oh, it's okay. No, it's not. Myself included. I get pop pies all the time from the Holy Spirit. If I want revival in my life, if we want to see revival in this church, if we want souls to get saved and come out of the world, then they have to be able to come here and experience the Spirit of God and the presence of God. And you know how that happens? When we begin to clean ourselves first. When we begin to deal with our own junk. And the Holy Spirit really comes and becomes Lord in our lives. So that when we're out there, people look at us and they say, man, they're honest. Man, they look like love. They look like Jesus. They look like what the Word of God says. See, that makes a difference and it matters. And it matters. Another thing that stops revival, or that hinders revival division among churches and ministries. Do not judge any other church. Do not look down on any other church. Be they Lutheran, Methodist, old school, new school, Pentecostal, Baptist. If they believe in Jesus, if they believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and that there's no other way to the Father but through Jesus Christ, they are your brother. Whether they speak in tongues or they don't speak in tongues. Whether they wear pants or they don't wear pants, it doesn't matter. Wear one body. So we're called to love, and when we don't walk in love, and we reject, oh, they're old school. That hinders revival. Because in revival, there's unity. In revival, there's love. There's oneness. So that division among churches, that hinders revival. Division among ministries. We're all one ministry. You hear Corey say it all the time. We're one church. We're one church. There's one body of Jesus Christ. There may be ministries in different locations, but we are all one. We're all one. What's another thing that hinders, very quickly, the spirit of greed among pastors and even church members? I think that's one of the 
of the greatest things about tithing and giving and being a giver. Every time you give, you're killing the spirit of greed. Every time you give, you're stepping on the spirit of greed and you are saying to yourself, my trust is not in my check, but my trust is in God. Yes. Human nature says, no, keep everything for you. You never know when you're going to have a rainy day, so you got to just hold on to everything. But the kingdom of God says, give, yes. and it shall be given unto you. Yes. Press down, shake it together, and running over. But when in the church there's a spirit of greed and everything becomes about money in the heart, yes, it's right to bring the tithe and the offering. Yes, it is. It's, it, it is the word of God. But at the point that in my heart as the pastor, my heart turns and now I'm only doing what I'm doing for the dollar, God can't honor that. God can't bless that. If I only sing because I want to make the money, God can't bless that. If as a pastor, I'm trying to finagle and figure out, oh, every which way we can just pull every single dollar out of every single person, God's not going to bless that. Because it's in the motivation. It's in the heart. Yes. Why do I do what I do? Yes. Would I still do it if nobody gave it? Nobody gave their tithe. If nobody sold, would I still preach with passion? Would I still talk to people about Jesus? Would I still be pursuing the plan of God for my life? Or is it just for the money? See, God seeks the heart. We can put on all day. But God looks through all of that and he says, what's really in your heart? Why do you do it? Why do you do it? So if we're going to experience a move of God, that spirit of greed in the leadership, that spirit of greed in the church, it has to go. It has to go. One of the greatest revivals in our century, or in the past century, of Azusa, the Azusa Street Revival, that is when the spirit of speaking in tongues and the power of the Holy Spirit came back because they had left the church for a while. And if you study the Azusa Street Revival, they never received not one offering. Not one offering. They never received a for I don't know if people just came and gave it anyway, but they never received a formal tithe and offering. Because those that were leading, those that were in front of the revival, wanted to make sure that greed didn't get in the way of hindering the great move of God that was happening. Help us, Holy Spirit. Teach us in the day of merchandising self-exaltation. Teach us where the balance is. Where we can take care of our fiscal responsibilities but still keep our heart in the right place so that we don't hinder the move of God. What's another thing that hinders revival? Hollow preaching. Empty preaching of the gospel that doesn't challenge people to seek the presence of God above all things. We have to preach the gospel. Pastors, if you're a pastor and you're watching, you have to preach the gospel. You cannot curb your messages to just make people feel good. Or because you want the amens or you want the hey, glory to God, hallelujah. Even if you don't get one amen, if you know that you are speaking what God told you to speak, have confidence in that. Be strong in that. Because that's like me sitting down my daughters every single day and just giving them ice cream for breakfast, ice cream for lunch. And ice cream for dinner. Every meal, we're going to have ice cream. Will they develop? Will they grow? No. Because I'm giving them something that has calories, but it has no nutrition. It's the same way in the spirit. If we don't give you word that gives you spiritual nutrition in the spirit, you'll be like a little dwarf. In the spirit, the enemy will come into your life and he will beat you down to a pulp. Because in the spirit, you're this tall. You haven't developed you haven't grown. You haven't been taking your vitamins. You haven't been eating the word of God. You have not been consuming the nutrition that you need to grow. So that empty preaching, that preaching that's just to make everybody feel good, if we're going to have a real move of God and people are really going to encounter God and not just religion, we got to really start giving people the word of God. The word that challenges the word that teaches us to pray. The word that teaches us who we are in Christ. The word that teaches us how to repent. The word that teaches us who we are and, and what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to look like and how to live our lives. The word that teaches us how to submit to our husbands and husbands honor and love your wives. The word that teaches us how to give. The word that teaches us how to submit one to another. 
The word that teaches you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The word that teaches you not to allow bitterness to remain in your heart. You got to pluck it out. The true word of God. So that we can grow. So that we can grow. Number eight. The eighth thing. One of the eight things that hinders a move of God, a revival, is by grieving the Holy Spirit and not giving him the appropriate respect and lordship in the church and in our lives. In your life, it's important for you to understand, and many of, all, many of you already know this, that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Word of God says that the Father sent the Holy Spirit to be your teacher, to be your comforter, to be your guide. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He's a person. He is always with you. So when you say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, the Holy Spirit comes from me. I'm here. He comes to help you learn the word. He comes to help you be patient. He comes to develop you and to help you look like Jesus. So there's going to be times where somebody wants to date you and your stomach rumbles and you just feel like, oh, I don't know about this. But your head says, me, but he sure is cute. I mean, we're just going to coffee. What's the big deal? And coffee turns into dinner. Dinner turns into a movie. And the movie turns into a one night stand. And the one night stand becomes two night stands. And then the two becomes three. And three becomes 25. And the next thing you know, you've been in a relationship that is not healthy for you for three years. And you don't know how to get out because you ignored. This little feeling in the pit of your stomach that was placed there by a person called the Holy Spirit that loves you and wants the very best for you. The Holy Spirit has had conversations with God about your life. He knows where you're supposed to be. He knows when you're supposed to get there. He knows the path and the plan that God has for your life. So you keep trying to go right, but he's like, no, 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 come, 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 come. You're supposed to be going this way. You're like, no, no, but I'm like, better. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you, but it's going to hurt. You're going you're gonna to get some bumps and bruises going down that way, but that's not, that way was not prepared. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That way wasn't prepared for you. The Word of God says that the Lord prepares. He prepares. So that means over here is this beautifully paved brand road. You know how it is when you start driving down a road that's just newly paved. No potholes. No cracks. It's just smooth. Man, this is a nice street. And you're just rolling because it's just so smooth. But then you know what it's like when you have this dirt road over here. And it got potholes and it got gravel. and you <laughs> Because that road was not prepared for you. So you're trying to go down your own road and your own path and your own way. And you're going through all these unnecessary bumps and bruises when you could be cruising. Tearing up your car, just tearing up your life. Tearing up your muffler is falling off because you're trying to just do all this off-road travel. And God is like, that's not the way that I prepared for you. A child of God that honors the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can have your dreams and you can, you can put out five different applications and you're looking for that job, but after you fill out all the applications, out of respect, you say, now Holy Spirit, whichever job is the one that you have for me, let that be the one that comes through. God, if it's not your will, even if it looks great, God, just close the door because I just want to be in your will. I just want to be in your protection. There's a song that says, the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. And it's true. The safest place. When you're in the will of God and you know that God is ordering your steps, man, there's such a peace in that. And even when things go wrong, you have a peace because you know, man, I came this way because God told me to come this way. So he's got it. It's as simple as acknowledging him. What does the word of God say? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not. Lead not your own understanding. So yes, you can make decisions for your life and you can make plans for your life, but at the end of it, just take those plans and just place them before the Lord and say, God, if this
this gentleman is not the one. I used to pray that prayer all the time. God, if he's not the one, let him show his true colors. God, if he's not the one, let it fall apart. God, if he's not the one, then yank him out of my life. Because I've learned that I do not have the capacity. I've learned that I don't have the capacity to make the right choice. I start making my decisions for all the wrong reasons. And I have a witness. Has anybody ever made decisions for all the wrong reasons? Ariana lifted her hand. You better put your hand down. <laughs> we make decisions for all the wrong reasons. Oh, he smells so good. Oh, man, he looks so nice. Oh, man, his car is so nice. And the Lord and the Holy Spirit and the Father, they're going... But we're so wrapped up. And we do that same thing with jobs. We do that thing with, with positions, with relationships. We do that in so many areas. That hinders the move of God. Especially when it's pastors. And people that are leading congregations. Me and Corey have to be able to say, Holy Spirit, what do you want? Holy Spirit, how do you want? Holy Spirit, if the service is going to be two hours, so be it. Let it be two hours. And whoever got to go, let them go. Holy Spirit, you want us to pray? I don't feel like we need to pray on Friday. Okay, God, we're going to be here on Friday because you want us to pray. Holy Spirit, we want to give you the respect that you deserve. Holy Spirit, what is your plan for this church? Holy Spirit, what is your mind? What is your thought? What do you desire for our lives? And he gets excited. He's like, now I can begin to release to you blessings and order your steps. I tell people all the time, say, I don't know how I got here. I don't know how, I, I'm not here because I made all the right choices. I'm not here because I, 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 I never made a mistake. I didn't end up with a wonderful husband because I, I was never in a bad relationship. I had bad relationships. Enough, enough. But somehow in my fumbling, and somehow, somehow in my, in my stupidity, Somehow in my mistakes, somehow in my shortcomings, every once in a while, I would say, God, just do what you want to do. God, if you would just help me. And he kept coming. And he kept coming to me. And he kept dealing with me. He kept changing my heart. Until he nudged me just enough to get me in the center of his will. So when I look at myself standing in the center of God's will, I don't take the glory. I can't take the credit. Because I know I, I did not put myself there. So I can't glory. I can't take the credit. I can't say, ooh, I'm such a super Christian. No, that's the grace of God. That, that's what you call grace. Because at every youth retreat, the Holy Ghost would come in. And the next thing you know, <laughs> Treat. Yeah, I, I would go back to school and then start cutting up again, but God would never forget those prayers. And whenever he had the opportunity, he would snatch me up. Or he would snatch me up so quick just at the right time. But that comes with giving the Holy Spirit what? That first place. Just acknowledging him. As pastors, acknowledge him. As a young woman in your single season, acknowledge him in your relationships. In your marriage, acknowledge him. He'll teach you how to treat your husband. He'll teach you how to treat your wife. Because we're giving him first place. He'll teach us how to pastor the people that are assigned to us. We have to give him first place so that the move of God and the spirit of God can be present. Number nine, corruption in the pulpit is a hindrance to the move of God because leaders are trying to become like God. We have to know how to get out of the way and lead you to God, not become your God. There's a difference. As pastors, we, we don't become your God. We lead you to God. Amen? At number 10, one of the biggest, biggest hindrances to revival and the move of God is when we think that just because there's large crowds, there's large buildings, there's a lot of people, that it's revival. If there's a lot, there's a lot of people at the Super Bowl, but it doesn't mean that it's a move of God. There's a lot of people at the mall, but that doesn't mean that there's a revival happening. If you see a lot of people and a lot of big buildings and a lot of money, but there's no repentance, there's no crying out to God, 
there's no God, I need you. There's no Holy Spirit, have your way. If there's no tears, if there's no change, then we're just all getting together. But I believe that God is raising up a people that don't just want church, but we want an encounter with God. Yes. We really, really want to encounter who God is. If that's you, I want you to stand up to your feet. That you, you, want to, you want to know who God is. You want to hear his voice. You want to be in line with his will. Yeah. You want to take your relationship with him to the next level. Yes. Have you ever been dating somebody and they said to you, I think it's time for us to take our relationship to the next level. I think God says that to us all the time. We be trying to stay out over here and he look at us and say, hey, I would like for us to take our relationship to the next level. Would you just lift your hands? Even those of you that are watching online, if you would just lift your hands and say with me, Lord Jesus, Teach me to align my heart with you. Open my ears to hear your voice. When you convict me, help me to be quick to repent, to say I'm sorry. Make me one that wants you more than anything. Teach me how to look like a believer that we saw in the New Testament so that we can desire you, hunger for you, know you, so you can change us, get all this mess out, and make us more like you so that we can be effective. Pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit. Send a revival. Send a move of God that your spirit would overflow at every gathering, every gathering of prayer, every service, that your spirit would be in charge, that you would heal those that are sick, break the bondage, break, break addiction, fear, doubt, In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you learned something tonight. Come on, give God praise for his word. And let's take this time before we go to prepare our tithe and our offering. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. If you're watching online, grab a piece of paper and write this down. You can text Rain Fire, one word, Rain Fire, to 779. Seven, seven. You can text Ring Fire, one word, to 77977. We believe in tithing, which is giving to God 10% of everything that comes to you. We also believe in giving free will offering whenever God lays it on our heart above and beyond our time to build the house of God. The word of God says, bring to me the time to the storehouse so that there could be food in my house, so there could be meat in my house. And so... That is our life insurance. God is able to sanctify everything that belongs to us when we give him our time. There's blessing associated with our time. Amen. Hallelujah. So those of you that are watching, when you get off the periscope, you can do that. Or you can do it now if you want to. And then just jump back on. Hallelujah. give to God because because we love him and because we believe his word it's just that simple it's just that simple when you're ready to give or if you've given on your phone you can stand up on your feet because we do believe that giving is a worship to God giving is a worship to God so begin to just speak over your seed begin to speak over your seed and command it to multiply begin to speak over your seed and say I'm blessed Stay with me in Jesus' name. I'm a tither. I'm a giver. And because of this, I am blessed. Because I give, God opens the windows of heaven and pours out blessings that we have no room to receive. God is a God 
of covenant. When I do my part, he does his part. So we declare surprise check. We call bonuses. We call business opportunities. We call favor. We call finances. I'm a money magnet. And money comes to me so I can do the will of God and sow into the kingdom and help those that are in need. We declare debt cancellation, supernatural provision. God is the source of my life and of this house in Jesus' name. Amen. I release you to come in the name of the Lord Jesus as we sow with joy and thanksgiving.